Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to talk about the drugs that are prescribed for mental health problems. So that includes things like depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, uh, and bipolar disorder, and other things. Um, I'm used to talking to a, a, an audience that are particularly interested in mental health, so I, I will try and explain terms. Um, but if, if there's anything people don't understand, do you know, just wave your hands around and I'll try and uh, explain it a bit further. Um, so I, I want to emphasize that I am a practicing psychiatrist and I do prescribe drugs. And I do think that sometimes some drugs can be useful. What I'm going to try and put over in this talk is the idea that we really profoundly misunderstand what, we do, what, what they actually do. And because we misunderstand them, we are not using them wisely and we're probably causing a lot of harm. So I want to look at the assumptions that underpin the current view of what drug treatments for mental health problems do. I want to suggest an alternative way of understanding them. And I want to think a little bit about how and why we have, we have this misunderstanding in the first place. And just to say um, that the book that's on sale here is The Bitterest Pills, but I've written two other more general books about psychiatric drugs. And, and maybe I would particularly recommend the one in the middle because it's, if anyone is particularly interested, just because it's a short but quite detailed guide to all the different drugs that are prescribed for mental health problems. So this is the situation at, um, recently in the United Kingdom there is an increase in the overall use of drugs for mental health problems, a substantial increase which is accounted for mainly by a huge increase in the prescribing of antidepressant drugs. When I looked at this data, I thought maybe that, had be, that might be compensated for by a fall in the prescription of other classes of drugs, but as you can see, that's not happened. In fact, most other classes of drugs have have risen as well. So we're using more and more drugs for mental health problems. And for at least the last 20 or 30 years, they have been promoted alongside this message that what they are doing is targeting an underlying chemical imbalance. So there are all sorts of pharma websites that give you this message that, um, that antidepressants work by balancing the brain chemistry. I particularly like this one because you've got the picture of of the lady in the very balanced position there, just to emphasize the balancing role um, of, of psychiatric drugs. And this is one version of the accepted view, the accepted mainstream view that's accepted by the medical profession as well, of what psychiatric drugs are doing. Um, so, so it, it, and, and this is the idea that they are correcting an underlying biological abnormality in the brain. One version of that, one suggestion of that biological abnormality is that it consists of a chemical imbalance, and I'm sure you're familiar with all these pictures of nerve endings and neurotransmitters crossing the nerve endings. There have also been suggestions that it's to do with abnormal cir neural circuitry, the connections between the different parts of the brain. And this idea is what I've called the disease-centered model of drug action, the idea that drugs are correcting an underlying abnormal brain state. It's a, it's a model that we've borrowed from general medicine, where most medicines can be understood to work in that way. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the drug is treating the ultimate cause of the disorder, the drug might just be working on the physiological mechanisms that produce the symptoms, but it's working on some, mechanism, some underlying mechanisms um, that, that have gone wrong and that are producing the symptoms of the disorder. So an example might be treatments for asthma. They don't, uh, the, the, the inhalers that you take when you're wheezing, they don't cure the disease of asthma, but they work on the mechanisms that produce the constriction of the airways that produces the wheeze. Um, and uh, insulin for diabetes, that's often um, trotted out as a, as a paradigm, um, as a model for, for what psychiatric drugs might be doing, in fact. Insulin is, again, is not curing the cause of diabetes, but by replacing the failing insulin supply, it's helping to normalize the body in some way. <coughs> 
And painkillers like aspirin and paracetamol can also be understood in, in this way. They, again, are not working on the cause of a disease, but they are working on the physiological mechanisms that produce pain. Now, the alternative way of understanding what drugs are doing when we give them for people, to people with mental health problems is what I've called the drug-centered model. And this model is suggesting that in contrast to the disease-centered model that's suggesting that drugs are rectifying an underlying abnormality, the drug-centered model suggests that they actually create an abnormal brain state. Or to put it in a slightly less um, uh, aggressive way, maybe, they, they create an altered brain state. And this is because the drugs that we prescribe for mental health problems are what we might call psychoactive drugs. That means they're drugs that pass the blood-brain barrier and go into the brain and change the brain. And by changing the brain, they change the way that people think and behave and, and uh, people's emotional responses as well. And what this model is suggesting is that the effects that we see when people take psychiatric drugs, whether we deem them to be useful or not useful, are a consequence of these alterations, these alterations to normal brain processes. So an example of this model might be the use of alcohol for social anxiety. When I was training as a junior doctor, I was taught that alcohol could be useful for people with intense social anxiety. It wasn't being suggested that, that social anxiety was due to an alcohol deficiency. <laughs> it wasn't even being suggested that alcohol was correcting some underlying chemical imbalance. It was being suggested that the alterations produced by alcohol, the typical state of alcohol intoxication, which we're all familiar with, is characterized by social disinhibition. And that could help counteract intense social anxiety in someone who suffered from that. Another example which I think is useful to highlight is the use of opiate analgesics. Now, opiates probably have, do have, some direct mechanism, some, some direct action on pain conduction mechanisms, so they slow down pain conduction. That part of their action is a disease-centered action. But unlike things like aspirin and paracetamol, opiates are mind-altering drugs, psychoactive drugs. Um, and one of the alterations that opiates produce is that they cause this state of emotional indifference or disengagement. So people who've taken opiates for pain will often say that they still have some pain, but they don't care about it anymore. And that aspect of their action is a drug-centered action, what I'm calling a drug-centered action, to distinguish it from their action on uh, the actual pain pathways. So this drug-centered model of drug action is emphasizing, as I said, that the drugs that are prescribed for mental health problems are psychoactive drugs or mind-altering drugs that produce altered mental states, changes in thinking, emotion, and behavior, but of course, they don't just affect the brain, they affect the body as well. So there are physical and bodily alterations that are associated with the mental alteration. So if you think of, for example, the sedation that might be caused by a drug like Valium, for example, there is both a mental and a physical component to that effect. And we are used to thinking of the term psychoactive drugs in association with drugs that are used for recreational purposes, so drugs that make people feel good, feel high, feel nice. Um, sometimes it's, it's, they're said to cause euphoria. But there are drugs that alter the way, that, that cross the blood-brain barrier and alter the way that we think and feel that can make people feel bad. A psychoactive drug doesn't necessarily need to make people feel good. And many of the drugs that are prescribed to people with mental health problems actually make them feel quite nasty. Now, I think it's important to realize that people have used psychoactive drugs for uh, as, as long as we, we have historical records to alleviate misery and suffering. So this is a picture by the English artist Hogarth of Gin Lane, everyone getting furiously drunk on gin in the 18th century in London. Uh, conditions were really pretty horrible, and, and it's quite possible that it was just the gin that um, got people through. <laughs> 
There was also, um, in, in later in the 19th century, there were very high levels of use of a substance called laudanum, which was a mixture of alcohol and opium. And this was widely used for, uh, for pain, for, for treating all sorts of, of um, illnesses, uh, and, and given to children in, in, um, quite liberally as well. Cocaine was a popular substance which was widely available until it started to be restricted at the beginning of the 20th century. It was put into this, into this wine, a mixture of alcohol and cocaine, which was endorsed by one of the popes, won the Pope's Golden Award. And of course, it was put into Coca-Cola and, and um, widely used as a, as a stimulant in, in Coca-Cola. Now, Treatment for mental health problems in the early 20th century was generally regarded as being very non-specific. People, it was thought that getting people into an asylum, giving them lots of fresh air and putting them to work was what was really going to help people. Drugs were used quite liberally, but they were, they were, used, they were used on the understanding that they were acting in a drug-centered sort of way as general sedatives mainly. So a whole load of different sorts of sedative drugs like opium and barbiturates um, were used liberally in these old asylums. And when stimulants came along, when the amphetamines were discovered in the 1930s and 40s, they started to be prescribed as well. And as I said, these drugs were understood at that time as far as anyone really thought about or analyzed drug treatment according to a drug-centered model. They were understood as causing alterations to normal um, mental functions. So this is a, an advertisement for barbiturates, clearly emphasizing their sedative properties. And this is an advertisement for amphetamines, emphasizing how much more smart and confident um, and busy you would be if you, if you were using amphetamines. Then mental health um, treatment started to change in the middle part of the 20th century. And it changed because a number of physical procedures were introduced, some of which we still have. Um, the first one was malarial therapy for people with chronic syphilis. The idea was that if you gave people malaria, the high temperatures would kill off the bug that was causing the syphilis. Uh, and, and the old asylums used to have mosquito breeding areas in order to produce the uh, malaria. Um, it probably wasn't effective and uh, was obviously quite dangerous. But it made, people, it made the people who worked in asylums feel that they were doing something, something properly therapeutic and something properly medical. And then another set of, of uh, bizarre procedures was introduced, starting with insulin coma therapy. And this was the idea that if you gave people um, high doses of insulin, put them into a coma for a few hours and then woke them up suddenly with a shot of glucose, that would sort of shock them out of their mental disorder. And it was particularly recommended for um, people with schizophrenia, so this is a slide of, of it being given. Again, it was a very dangerous procedure, um, certainly ineffective. But again, it was really important because people believed it was effective, and not only did they believe it was effective, they believed that it was actually acting on the underlying disease of schizophrenia in, in one way or another. ECT was another procedure that came in around this time. It was introduced again for the treatment of people with schizophrenia, but gradually it came to be associated with the treatment of people who had what was then called manic depression or sometimes just very severe depression, usually a sort of psychotic type depression. Again, like insulin coma therapy, there was no clear idea about how it might be working, but there was a sort of feeling that somehow it was working on the underlying mechanisms that produced these, these conditions. People speculated maybe it was um, working on the pituitary gland or brain circuits, which um, comes up and again and again. So this, this is important because at the time that modern psychiatric drugs were introduced in the 1950s, psychiatry had started to believe that it had some really effective, sophisticated treatments that targeted the underlying conditions that, 
uh, of the people that, that it was trying to help. And this was the context into which these new drugs came. So chlorpromazine was the first of the drugs that were introduced in this, at this time, which are still being used, or similar drugs are still being used. Chlorpromazine is one of the class of drugs that we would now refer to as antipsychotics. So when they came in, they were greeted very enthusiastically. Their use soon spread throughout France, as you can see from this slide, um, and throughout Europe. And in the US, they were introduced by a huge campaign organized by the uh, by Smith Klein French, the drug company that, that was marketing them here. The chief executive of the company went on national television to announce the arrival of this miracle drug that was going to be so effective. Um, but when they were first introduced, they were not understood as disease targeting treatments. They were understood as special sorts of sedative. They were still being understood according to that drug-centered model of drug action. And they were referred to in the early days as neurological inhibitors. They were seen as drugs that basically slowed down or suppressed nervous system activity. Um, later, they were known as neuroleptics, a name that's still, still used. That means to seize or restrict the nervous system. Um, and they were also referred to as major tranquilizers, which again, I think, captures the alterations they produce quite well. And you can, you can see that this was the understanding from these early advertisements. This is an early advertisement for a, a, another early antipsychotic drug, which uh, clearly emphasizes the tranquilizing properties. These properties were thought to be useful for a whole variety of indications, so the drugs were widely promoted for the treatment of agitation in the elderly. Um, for behavior problems in children and for anxiety in adults. But gradually, over the course of the 1950s and 60s, there develops the idea that they are actually treating an underlying disease in some way, that they're doing something specific, that they're doing more than just tranquilizing people. And by 1970, you've got the idea that they are targeting psychotic symptoms or targeting the underlying basis of psychosis or schizophrenia, and they start to be referred to as antipsychotics. A similar thing happens with antidepressants. The first drugs that are, um, that are thought to have antidepressant properties are actually stimulants. It's quite clear from the first accounts of their effects that they're stimulants give them too long or too high dose to people and you make them psychotic like you do with amphetamines. Um, but then gradually the idea comes about that no, they're more specific than stimulants. They're doing something a bit different and you get a range of drugs that actually doesn't have stimulant properties and they start to be referred to as specific agents and as antidepressants. So over the course of the 1950s and 60s, you get this change in understanding of drugs from understanding them according to that drug-centered model to understanding them according to a disease-centered model. And I think you can see this change most clearly in the way that drugs are classified and named. So prior to the 1950s, they're just very uh, crudely classified according to the different sort of states they produced in, into sedatives or stimulants. After the 1950s, they come to be understood and named and classified according to the disease that they are thought to treat. So from that time on, we start to get the, the names like antipsychotics, antidepressants, anxiolytics. And the classification of, of, of uh, drug treatments is completely reorganized at this time um, and, and organized according to diseases. Now, this transformation does not happen because there is a lot of evidence that drugs are actually working on an underlying disease. That's a really Im important point to understand. There wasn't then and there isn't now any evidence or there's very little evidence that drugs are acting in that way. What happens is that so it, it starts to be suggested that drugs are working in this way and people just start to forget that there was actually ever any other way of understanding what they might be doing. So for example, 
In the early days of the introduction of antipsychotics, there's a lot of interest in the sort of alterations they produce, and, and people take them themselves, and they write about the experience of what it's like, how it makes them feel different, and they observe other people taking them. Um, 20 years later, you've got nothing of that. No one is interested that, in that at all, and when we get the new generation of antipsychotic drugs introduced in the, 1950, in the 1990s, you wouldn't know what sort of alterations they're producing because no one, no one thinks that that's an important question to ask anymore. Now, what sort of um, evidence might support this uh, a disease-centered model and, and why have we not got it? Well, the first thing to say is that most of the evidence that we base our use of drugs on consists of placebo-controlled trials. And placebo-controlled trials do not distinguish whether a drug is having a drug-centered action or whether it's having a disease-centered action, because you're comparing an active drug with an inert placebo. So that drug, if it's a psychoactive drug, is going to be producing alterations, and then it also might or might not be working on an underlying disease. The disease-centered model might be supported if we had good evidence of what does cause psychiatric conditions and if we had evidence that the drugs were working to reverse those processes at some level. Um, and as a very minimum to support the disease-centered model, we would want evidence that drugs that are thought to have disease-targeting actions are superior to drugs that are not. And it turns out, of course, that we, we don't have any of this evidence. We, some, we have some hypotheses for the for, for how conditions like schizophrenia and depression might be caused. Um, and one of the most famous is the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia and psychosis, which suggests that uh, these conditions are due to an overactivity of dopamine. This hypothesis came about because people noticed that some of the early drugs that were being given for this condition um, blocked dopamine receptors, and therefore using the logic of the disease-centered model, they said, ah, so the, the disease must be caused by the opposite of this. Um, but actually, they're trying to find direct evidence that there are dopamine abnormalities has proved very difficult. And it turns out that actually, um, although some of the early drugs did have quite profound dopamine blocking activities, like the haloperidol there with, with the, the dopamine blocking action is the um, yellow color, um, some of the other drugs that are used as antipsychotics, including clozapine, which is this, this one here, which is regarded as being probably the most effective antipsychotic available, actually its dopamine blocking actions are relatively small compared to all the other um, chemi brain chemicals that it's acting on and uh, altering. <laughs>